my name is Sue Leonard. I write for the Irish Examiner. I interview authors for them, and I'm a ghostwriter on the side. And I just love this festival so much. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, so today, it's Canada Day. We have Craig Davidson, and we have Cherie Dimoline. Um, and this, this event is in partnership with the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Um, they are so prolific, these two. They have won so many awards that if I were to list them, I don't think I'd have time to ask them any questions, so I won't bother. But let's just say they are multi-award winning writers. Um, the Marrow Thieves is uh, Sherry's book, which is for the, a young adult book, and it's a dystopian book about the future. It's brilliant. And Craig has written The Saturday Night Ghost Club, which is funny and touching. Um, so I'm not going to say any more except to introduce them. Um, so first they're going to read, and then I'm going to um, fire questions at them, and then we will open it to the floor at the end. Okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Sue, for the um, introduction. I'm going to read, yeah, really quickly from my book called The Saturday Night Ghost Club, just, just the beginning of it. Um, it doesn't really need much of an introduction, I don't think. Um, there might be a few spots where if people are queasy about surgical procedures, they might want to, <laughs> I don't know, avert, avert their ears somehow. Uh, most people believe the human brain is solid. They imagine a loaf of bread soaked in gelatin that you can hack off quivering slices, same as you would with jello mold at a family picnic. But the truth is, the brain's texture is more like toothpaste. Brain matter will squeeze through a keyhole. And in cases of severe cranial swelling, surgeons use a drill. I myself prefer the RA2, a Korean model, to bore into the skull. And if the swelling cannot be stopped, the living brain will project from the hole in an inverted funnel. This is called a coning, and it marks an end. Most people also believe that the brain is gray. Its cells are called gray matter after all. Uh, and isn't that how the organ looks in horror flicks? This big slaty walnut floating in a jar of formaldehyde in some mad scientist lab? But I can tell you that a sheathed brain is bracingly pink. The tissue only turns gray once the cerebrospinal sac has been perforated and once the air hits it. When a brain cones, that tissue changes color. Tracers of ash thread through the, that bubblegum pink as a million thoughts flicker and die. People think that neurosurgeons cut into brains with a scalpel, and that's just another myth. How can you possibly carve toothpaste? And an infant's brain matter is even less substantial than an adult's. It's really something like pancake batter. And I operate with a sucker wand, which is a tool exactly as it sounds. And as I investigate the runnels of a patient's brain, it grips me that something unforgivingly solid, my wand, is moving through something ephemeral and dreamlike, a patient's memories. And though I work carefully and with a keen knowledge of the cerebral topography, my wand will always remain a beast blundering through fields of budding shoots. If I trample something critical, that patient may awaken lacking a vital memory, that one where they gazed into the sky as a child wondering how a star might taste, settling on breathtaking wintergreen, the smell of their newborn daughter's scalp, or that haunting tingle on their lips following their first kiss. So I navigate the storerooms of a patient's consciousness, passing memories in their golden vaults, my wand clumsily bayonetting, it too often seems, the pink jelly that holds everything that patient is or ever will be. Hard as I try not to disturb the furniture, things happen. They do happen. And I am forced to accept these tragic outcomes for the same reason that the patients on my table must accept their own lot. That is, we are all only human, which is a condition of perpetual uncertainty and failure. And the brain is the seat of memory, and memory, I can tell you this, memory is a tricky thing. At base level, memories are stories, and sometimes these stories we tell allow us to carry on. Sometimes stories are really the best we can hope for. They help us to simply get by while deeper levers of our consciousness slap bandages on the wounds that hold the power to wreck us. So we tell ourselves that the people we love closed their eyes and slipped painlessly away from us. That our personal failures are the product of external forces rather than unfixable weaknesses. That we were really too damn good for the rat-ass bastards who jilted us anyway. And you tell yourself these stories for long enough, 
and you will discover that they have a magical way of becoming facts. But a secret can be hidden from everyone save its holder, and the brain is not only a storyteller, it is a truth-seeking organ. If the stories we tell are no more than overlay, the equivalent of six feet of clay covering a pool of toxic sludge, well, something is bound to bubble up, right? And the most awful truths will do so in the darkest hours of night, when we're the most vulnerable. And if you bury those secrets so deep that you forget they ever happened, okay, maybe you beat the devil. But the truth is a bloodhound. That's something I can tell you with certainty. The truth is that abandoned dog following you over sea and land, baying from barren clifftops, never tiring and never quitting, forever pining after you. And the day will come when that dog is at your porch, scratching insistently at your door, forcing you to claim it once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. I was hoping you would read uh, that part. It's one of my favorite parts. It's the reason why I think of you every time I brush my teeth, <clears throat> when I pick up the toothpaste. Um, bonjour, Ani. Hello. My name is Cherie Demeline. I'm a member of the Georgian Bay Métis community. So I'm an indigenous person from Canada, or what, what is currently called Canada. Uh, my community goes back much, much further than, than that. My mother's a member of the Anishinaabe tribe, so I guess uh, Ojibwe would be the word that we're known by. Um, so I wanted to say, as I do, I'm a visitor on this land. I feel very grateful that I'm allowed to speak, that I'm allowed to share the stories from my community with your community. And I wanted to tell you how beautiful it is to be in a place that embraces the original stories of the people who were here, how amazing it is, even just coming in when I landed uh, in Cork, seeing the Gaelic language was remarkable to me. And it, it made me feel like, um, like I knew your ancestors, and so I felt a little bit more at home. So my reading is going to be a little bit short, because I do need to give a, a bit of a preamble on the book. I feel very... I'm going to come over here a bit, so I can see you guys. Um, so I was asked a couple of years ago to write a story of indigenous speculative fiction. And I didn't really know what that would be. What does that mean? It's not science fiction, it's, it's sort of taking a wild guess as to what's going to happen in the future. And so I thought, okay, so that can either be a utopian story or it can be dystopian. And I'm a woman and I'm indigenous, so I went with dystopian, a bit of a pessimist. Um, and so I looked at dystopian stories and most of those are, are apocalypse stories. And so I thought, okay, can I write an apocalypse story? What can, how can I do this? And I realized in looking at it, here, here are the elements of, a, of an apocalyptic story. You take your characters, you make people love them, and then you put them through absolute hell, right? Like, what can I throw at these characters, and how far are people willing to, to travel with them? You have to challenge their entire way of, of living, of thinking, of being, and hopefully they survive. And it's, so it's the story of survival. And I realized, I was the best person to write an apocalypse story as an indigenous person because we have already survived one. Our entire way of life was, was changed. There were people literally hunting for our scalps. It was how they counted bounty. And we were on the run. And part of surviving was, who do you want to be at the end of your survival? What are the things you take with you to keep you being yourself? And so I started to write this story. It's in the very near future. In, this, in the Marrow Thieves, in this world, there's been cataclysmic climate change. So maybe not so much in the future as now. Um, there's been a loss of confidence in the government. The government has fallen apart again, maybe not so far in the future. And there's been a lot of sickness. There's a water war between Canada and the United States in the book. And uh, one of the, the sicknesses that have come upon the people is that they have lost the ability to dream. And we know from the study of onerology, which is the study of dreams, if you cannot dream, you can't process thought. And so in this time of the book, they're calling it a plague of madness. And so the government wants to get the people back to work. The population's diminished. And so they need to find a way to get them better. And so they need to restore their ability to dream. And they start to look around and they realize that there is one group, one population that has retained that ability, even through this, this plague. And it's the indigenous people in what we now call North America. And so they need to find a way to gather up the dreamers, to put them in a place, to hold them so that 
No matter how bad the circumstances are in this place, they won't lose the ability to dream until they can siphon it out. And it's rumored to be housed in the marrow of our bones. And so in Canada up until 1996, I don't know if you know this, we had what was called residential schools, where generations of our kids were taken off our, the reserves and out of our communities and were put into government-funded and church-run schools, uh, where we weren't allowed to speak our language, practice our way of lives, uh, and, and most of those children died, they were experimented on. Um, and so in this book, the government reopens residential schools as a way to hold the dreamers. And so um, I'm going to read a, a short part where the elder in the group, so, so this, the group that we're following, the main character's name is Frenchie. He's lost his biological family to the schools, but he's found a new family. And they're all on the run, they're heading into the north because there's a rumor that there's a strong indigenous rebellion starting in the north, so that's where they're headed. So the elder in the group is telling them a story. He wants them to remember what's happened so they know where they have to go. The earth was broken, too much taking for too damn long, so she finally broke. But she went out like a wild horse, bucking off as much as she could before lying down. A melting north meant the water levels rose and the water and the weather changed. It changed to violence in some cases, building tsunamis, spinning tornadoes, crumbling earthquakes. And the shapes of countries were changed forever, whole coasts breaking off like crest. And all those pipelines in the ground, they snapped like icicles and spewed bile over forests into lakes, drowning whole reserves and towns. So much laid to waste from the miscalculation of infallibility in the face of a planet's revolt. People died in the millions when that happened. The ones that were left had to migrate inward. It was like the second coming of the boats. So many sick people, not enough time to organize peacefully. But the powers that be still refused to change and bent the already stooped under the whips of a schedule made for a population twice its size and inflated by the need to rebuild. Those that were left worked longer, worked harder, and now the sun was gone for weeks at a time. The suburban structure of their lives had been upended, and so they got sicker. This time in the head, they stopped dreaming. And a man without dreams is just a meaty machine with a broken gauge. And people lost their minds, killing themselves and others, and even worse for the new order, refusing to work at all. They needed answers, solutions, so up here, the governors turn to the church and the scientists to find a cure for the missing dreams. In the meantime, those who could afford it turned to sleep counselors, took pills to go to bed and pills to wake up, and did things like group hypnosis to implant new dreams. <coughs> At first, people turned to indigenous people the way the New Agers had, all reverence and curiosity, looking for ways we could help guide them. They asked to come to ceremony. They humbled themselves when we refused. And when they changed on us, like the New Agers, looking for ways they could take what we had and administer it themselves, how could they best appropriate the uncanny ability we had to dream? How could they make ceremony better, more efficient, more economical? That was the first alarm set off in the communities. We thought that was the worst of it, if only. We were moved off lands that were deemed necessary to the government, same way they took reserve land during wartime because no one cared about long-range things like courting votes for the next election, and instead cared about things like keeping valued, wealthy community members safe. There were no negotiations, and we were just pushed off. The new migration from the coastlines was changing geography daily. And then, even after our way of life was being commoditized, after our lands were filled with water companies and wealthy corporate investors, we were still hopeful because we had each other. New communities started to form, and we were gathering strength. But then the church and the scientists that were working day and night on the dream problem came up with their solution, and everything went to hell. They asked for volunteers first, put out ads asking for people with, quote, indigenous bloodlines and good general health to check in with the local clinics for medical trials. They'd give you room and board for a week and a small honorarium to pay for your time off work. By then, our distrust had grown stronger and they didn't get many, many volunteers from the public, so they turned to the prisons. The prisons were always full of our people. 
Whether or not the prisoners went voluntarily, who knows? There weren't enough people worried about the well-being of prisoners to really make sure. And it began as a rumor that they had found a way to siphon the dreams right out of our bones. A rumor whispered every time one of us went missing. A rumor denounced every time their doctors sent us to hospitals and treatment centers never to return. They kept sending us away, enticing us to seek medical care, and then keeping us locked up, figuring out ways to hone and perfect, perfect their solution for sale. Soon they needed too many bodies, and they turned to history to show them how to best keep us warehoused, how to best position the culling. That's when the new residential schools started growing up from the dirt like poisonous brick mushrooms. We go to the schools, and they leech the dreams from where our ancestors hid them, in the honeycombs of slushy marrow buried in our bones. And us? Well, we join our ancestors, hoping we left enough dreams behind for the next generation to stumble across. Thank you. Sherry, thank you for mentioning that you felt at home. And I think it really struck me reading both books that your sense of story is very like the Irish sense of story. Mm. And I love the way that in both books you break off and tell stories. And in your case, of course, it's the stories of the patients. Would you, Craig, like to explain a little bit about who Jake is and his relationship with his uncle, just briefly? Uh, sure, I'll do my best. Um, Jake's kind of the narrator of the story. And in, uh, in early versions of the book, he was just, um, just a guy just a guy kind of talking about this summer that he had growing up. It's a, it's a fairly, classic's the wrong word, it's a fairly typical coming-of-age story, which is a sort of a story I'd always wanted to write. But um, I actually did my, oh, this is very humble braggy actually, I did my PhD at the University of Birmingham and what I was supposed to do, it was a creative writing. So, and I noticed Ruth Gilligan, you mentioned. Oh yes, Ruth, is Ruth was of one of my um, uh, mentor, I guess. She, she, she went through the... She's um, one of our young writers, I expect. Yes, you know. yeah. yeah. Um, she's a lo lovely Irish writer, a very and fiercely intelligent, great writer. Who wrote, who wrote her first book in her junior certificate year at the That's age of right. 50. That's right, yeah. Yes. And what? I, yeah, she's, <laughs> she's super young, too. Uh, I think, and the one that she was working on when I was there was... Um, was it Nine Folds of a Paper Swan? Oh, I think yes, that's is her right. newest, right? Yes, that was her first real literary. Yes, that's yeah. right, yeah. Um, and, uh, and so in, in doing that, um, basically you needed some sort of ap uh, academic apparatus to, to hang, hang it upon. And I thought, well, I'm really interested in the brain and in surgery and in memory. And so Jake sort of through that process became a doctor. Uh, a surgeon, and so he can look back on um, what his his uncle's malady of memory, which is a really uh, basically not to spoil anything, but it's 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 a, re a deeply repressed memory that yes. he has um, managed to through layers of overlay um, secretize from even himself, basically. Uh, and so that that was basically it. Um, Jake is your narrator, but he's commenting from a perspective of being a surgeon, and ultimately he comments from a perspective of being as ignorant to memory as anybody else, because he, he knows how the brain works to a small degree. I mean, it's the most, like, um, there is no corporeal object in the universe that we know that is anything to do with the complexity of the human brain. So he knows as much as he knows about it, but he can't really explain what's happened to his uncle. Um, and, so, and so I thought that would be an interesting way of kind of commenting um, in these forward sections. Uh, as uh, Jake is an adult narrator looking back on his childhood. He's a wonderful man, the uncle, isn't he? I mean, you start off when Jake is terrified of monsters and mm -hmm. his parents just say, well, there isn't a monster there, full stop. Right. But, but the uncle has another way of explaining it, which, is, which makes him not afraid at all, which is, yes, there is a monster, let's get rid of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is, is quite clever. Yes, I think with, with someone like that, I mean, we, my, my wife is here and we have a seven-year-old son and you're already seeing it in him. Um, the world kind of kicks out of you your, your childishness, mm. you know, the way of being able to look at the world as a child. And so to me, uh, that a person like Calvin would ever exist, and I've never actually met someone like Calvin who can go, who can actually have a childlike view upon the world and yes. believe in the things that he believed in as a kid, because ultimately, we're not, almost we're not allowed to believe in those things. Sure. You need to, it needs to be a, a, a fundamental aspect of, of strength and willpower to progress through your, your childhood mm. and believe the things that you believed as a kid. So it was fun to write a character who, even in a fictional way, would have navigated that and come out the other mm -hmm. side still. Um, I love the humor and, I mean, there's the, the father who had the violent streak. Um, <laughs> 
Um, but also he's a... You describe, you know, that he had a friend until the friend had somebody better to go to, he, this difficulty. <laughs> Is it in any? Is it autobiographical in any way? Do you draw from? Did you draw from your own life for this? Oh, I, I would you know say that probably both of our books and and, and I would say most yes. writers who I've met. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever met a writer who would claim that their book is wholly. To what uh, extent? To, well, to my extent, well, was I a, was I a schlumpy, redheaded, overweight nerd? Yes. <laughs> yes, I was. So in that way, it was it was very autobiographical, and um, and are the, the parents in the book somewhat very much like my own parents? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they are. And so there's a certain comfort to me in being able to have the opportunity, really now, however many books into my career. How just, many? Uh, well, if you count all the you, pen you, names and yes, stuff, yes, I, you have I, two other. You write. I, don't you, know. I mean, I could just as well be calling some you of them. I don't want to count. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them will, 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 will pretend they don't exist. But, but why uh, Patrick and Nick? Why two different names? Pa two pen well, names. Our, our son's name is Nicholas. So Nick, for, uh, I write uh, horror books under Nicholas, uh, no, sorry, Nick Cutter. And Nick, Nick is an honorific to my son, our son. And Cutter was just me and my uh, agent were sitting down and like, well, horror net writers need to have really declarative, right. you know, so like, how about Butcher? No. You know, Hacker. No. <laughs> How about Cutter? Yeah, okay, sure, we'll do that. So it's kind of almost a, you know, Barker, King, Rice, you know, it's sort of in that sort of declarative horror writer last your name. Your agent meetings sound a lot more fun than my agent meetings. What, are yours, what, are, what, are yours, what happens in yours, Sheree? We do not come up with cool pseudonyms. <laughs> I'll bring it up uh, at the next meeting. You should, yeah. yeah. I mean, I love your name, though. Just keep, keep it as it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to write under a pen name. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Shiri, um, yes. I read that you weren't expecting this book to do very well outside the indigenous community, mm. and that, in fact, you are the, probably the only person in this room who has cause to be grateful to President Trump. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, now there's going to be a mob. Uh, let me explain that. Um, so <laughs> I, I would love to get him in a room and talk to him about things, <laughs> but um, what happened was the book came out and uh, it, it did well in Canada and then I started to get these calls from the United States uh, from different magazines and newspapers wanting to talk about it and I thought it was really odd just because the book is, is you know, set in, in the Canadian landscape and it's about uh, you know, all the main characters, the heroes are indigenous uh, and they're all mostly from, from nations and tribes uh, in our territory. And so I remember asking one reporter uh, in California, she said, you know, at the end, do you have any questions? And I said, I just have one. Um, why do people in California care about, you know, this book? And she said, I'm sorry, do you not know who our president is? Hmm. It's the end of the world. And your book is about surviving the end of the world. And so there, it took on this whole other uh, level of, yeah. of people, um, uh, you know, uh, appreciating and, and, and understanding what the, what the story of survival was. Does this feel like your breakthrough book, or have you had one of those... I mean, did it, does it feel like the book that's made a difference to you? It, it does. So, so the first draft of the book, uh, when I sent it to the publisher, my other books were uh, collections of short stories and, and a, a novel, and they were for, uh, you know, adult readers. And so uh, my publisher said, is, you know, the protagonist is young. He's, he's you know, 16 for the majority of, of the story. Yeah. He said, um, you know, it could go either way. Is, is this a young adult or is it adult? Um, and I said, well, I don't... I, what is really the difference in terms of marketing? I know what the difference is in writing. Uh, young adult is the same level of language, but everything is emotion first. Everything is the best day ever or the yeah. worst day ever. It's very emotional. Um, and he said, well, the difference in marketing is this. Uh, uh, if it's an adult book, it will be taken more seriously. Uh, if it's a young adult book, there's a slim chance it could get into schools, maybe. Right. And I thought, this was the book um, that I did, I had written for, I'd spent a lot of years working on reserves and um, where our, our kids were killing themselves at a, the suicide capital of the world is actually a very small reserve um, in Canada called Pekanjikum and children as young as nine were committing suicide and so I was doing work with those youth and I realized that they didn't even have the words to see themselves as individuals or as communities in the future. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, damn it, I'm just gonna write a world where you were the absolute answer. And not just for us, for all of us, these brilliant kids. And so that was why I wrote the book. But when he said, you know, there was a potential that it could be in Canadian schools, I thought, 
This is a story that I want people, kids, yes. to read. Um, and actually now um, it's replaced To Kill a Mockingbird in, in a lot of Has Canadian really? schools. Wow, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. That, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, sometimes with, the, with YA books, like our own Louise O'Neill, mm. they, they do an adult version. Yes. Mm. So yeah. that, that could happen too. It could happen. Right now, mm. I actually, um, um, before I uh, met you guys in the lobby to come here, I was furiously working on uh, the script. So we're doing a, it's being turned into a television, television series. So uh, we're looking wow. at partnering with Netflix. So it's, um, it's going to reach a whole different audience, we wow. hope. So, yeah. And do you think this will change your life as a writer? Do you, do you feel that? Um, it, already it already has. has. Yes. Yeah, it already has. It's, uh, um, Craig and I were actually on this, I don't know if you guys know about <laughs> Canada Reads. It's this like amazing slash terrifying. Yeah, there's a Canada Reads lover <laughs> back there, yeah. <laughs> Show where in Canada where they take, there's five of us, right? Mm -hmm, five. Five of us, and so they pick five books. and then Survivor of books. It's a survivor of books. And so we get these celebrity uh, people to defend us where, you know, so you had the Tornado Watcher. Tornado Watcher, yeah, great. Yeah, and yeah. I had a singer. Yeah, yeah, Jolly. And, um, and so they, they compete. It's, it's like on TV, wow. on radio, it's in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And so we're just supposed to, you know, like n not have a panic attack while people are tearing <laughs> apart our work. Um, and so it was funny because we were going into the, I mean, there was, it was crazy. So we're like, you know, I mean, for me, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what Craig does, but I, I work in my pajamas, you know, and smoke out my window so my kids don't find it um, and write. And so it went from this sort of like, you know, small life to now we're doing photo shoots and mm -hmm. stuff, which was ridiculous. Wow. Because you know you're, you have these five awkward writers, and it's like in a television studio, and you're like, I don't even know how to hold a book anymore. Yeah, like, look it's like so you're fighting each other. Yeah, and they're oh, like, no. they're like, act like you're mad oh, at each yeah. other, and we're like, is this okay? Yeah. Are you all right with this? It's, it's very it's, Canadian. Is there any way we can access this? Is it on a podcast or anything? It is. Oh, yeah, it's probably just yeah, be, yeah, be YouTube clips of it yeah. here and there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Neither of us won. I think we I think most I, you would you would have been the betting favorite though. It's weird <laughs> betting lines, but but I think too like in terms of life changing, we were at um, a New Year's Eve party with Mark Cote. Yes. Is who is the publisher of uh, of Cherie's book, and we got talking about Cherie, and um, you know he said basically by an astounding degree it is the most successful book that he has ever published. Wow. Um, by like by leagues of magnitude, sort of a thing. Wow. Um, and and he actually mentioned some of the numbers, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's a different. So you start talking about life changing. I I can only imagine that Cherie would if she would be indelicate enough to make some of the financial or otherwise statements, she would say, yeah, things are, I'm living at a different league of, of um, it, it has. And it's very, very rare that actually you have a book, probably, that, that does change your life, one single book. You know, mm -hmm. I've certainly never had one book I, that I could say was life-changing. It's more just like a John continual... John Boyd with the, with the boy in the There you go, pajamas. boy in the striped yep. pajamas. There's there, and there are plenty of them who, who, who have done it, but there are others in their career who probably it's more just like, one one foot in front of the other, one book sure. in front of the other. None none of them necessarily making a uh, a mic drop type of Eminem mic drop moment that you just mm -hmm. walk away. But um, uh, but but some of it's just like a continual application. But of course, these days the uh, debuts often make a huge splash, which is probably mm. a lot of pressure. Quite soon, isn't it? Mm. Do, are you quite so grateful that you're that. Yeah. established now that it's? I'm so so grateful. So this is my fourth book. So it was 11 years of building a career out of yeah. matchsticks, right? Yes. Trying trying to make stuff work, trying to see what landed, and 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 getting to know myself and my voice. Um, and so you know, sort of when the you know um, things blew up, uh, which they did for a bit, um, I was okay, and I yeah. and I feel. Um, you know, when I see young writers and they sort of explode onto the scene, I mean, part of me is like, who do they think they are? <laughs> you did not earn this. And the other part of me is like, oh my God, come to my house. I need to make you tea. Are you okay? Because yes. it is a lot of pressure. Yes, yeah. I, yeah, I, I would can, be, I for can sure. believe that. Craig, again, I have read that you take your research incredibly seriously. You're the sort of Daniel Day-Lewis of... Literature. Oh, I see. I, well, I wish. Uh, but, uh, uh, to, what, to what do you speak specifically? Co you to, uh, you took a course of steroids as research. I like how you call them a course. That's very, <laughs> that's very, very, very highfalutin. Yeah. yeah, I took steroids. Yeah, I did uh, years ago. Um, back before. Yeah, look at look. They're a rather deflated checking. now. They used to be a bit more. Uh, but yeah, I was living in Iowa, and as before, I met my wife. Uh, before uh, we had our son, and I had certainly nobody to guide me towards any proper method of decorum, but I, I think I was trying to be, I was writing a book called The Fighter, which actually, um, Sean pointed out that there's an old copy of it back there, and um, 
I thought, well, like Hunter S. Thompson or George Plimpton, uh, if you decide, you might as well throw yourself into, if you're going to write a character who does steroids, what better way to properly and, and understand... You, and, and you did a boxing match as well. Oh. Did you, is that true? Yeah. I think I was on steroids at that point. And <laughs> probably was, there were I two idiotic you, decisions may I that ask you, did followed you win? one another. Uh, I actually fought twice. Once I, I remember it was in Toronto, and they went out and found me an opponent, and they called me up, and they're like, Craig, you're going to be fighting a poet. And I said, all oh, right, thank God. <laughs> and then, uh, and his name was Michael Knox. And I thought, well, that's a threatening name, but that's oh, fine. He, I've met many poets, and they're lovely gents, and I think I'll be OK. And then I went and met him. And he was just like a skyscraping <laughs> homunculus. Uh, and so he beat me rather badly. Uh, <laughs> over three three rounds, it was a, like a sanctioned amateur bout, and I got I, I trained for it. Actually, I, I, the story I tell quite often is that I was down in Iowa, and I actually trained with the Kleinfelter sisters, both of whom were um, Olympic aspirants, right. and they were like 115 pounds, and they they beat me up way worse than Michael Knox ever did. Thank right. goodness. So I had that to go into the fight with Michael Knox, and then I fought again in New York uh, for the American debut against. Um, uh, Jonathan Ames, mm -hmm. who was another kind of crazy guy. And uh, both of them were fun. If I look back, I, if I were older and more thoughtful, I wouldn't have done it. But um, You don't need to look back. Just look on the internet. It's there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's all saved. Yeah, well, so yeah. yes, yes. Well, and, and, and actually, that could have fit, fed into this book because, you know, there are quite a few fights and broken noses. And, oh, know, there are. That, yeah, well, on. we all have our obsessions and bugaboos, and I'd like to get through a book but, without a fight breaking out, but I haven't done so yet. But please tell me that you didn't go into character and perform brain surgery. D no, you're... <laughs> <laughs> no, no one allowed me to do that. I was, you know, my, my wife works at Sick Kids Hospital, so I thought I'd poke around there and just say, hey, could I? We, I I'm doing research for a book. Would you let me wield the scalpel for a bit? But no, none of them. They none say, of them let get, you. get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Um, Betamax, you've got, you've got, you oh, know, these, yes, I, my, we had Betamax as well, you know, do, we you, call do you remember the Betamax. VHS? Do you call it Betamax? No, do you call it Betamax? I, I don't know what the right Now is. I have to think. I do call it Betamax, don't I? Betamax, yeah. okay. America, it's Betamax, or it was but, Betamax, but there is, it's gone there's now. there's lovely but things like that that bring us straight back into right. period, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was fun to write about childhood and that, that mm. time in my life. It's, it is a scary book, your book. Beautifully done. Um, and it is actually quite a popular genre at the moment, isn't it? The dystopia. You, you've, you've hit on to something before it happened, probably. Yeah, it's, uh, it is. It's, it's, and I didn't... I didn't really realize, because um, I wasn't reading a lot of it at the time, um, but it is really prevalent. And I think it's because of this tumultuous time we live in, where yes. we're, you know, we're looking for guidance, we're looking for relatability, and we want to see that there's a way through. Um, and the book is, it is scary. Um, it, is, it is based almost entirely on history, on things that have already happened. Um, but it is ultimately about what's going to get us through. Yeah. And so I think that was you know, sort of the through point for mm -hmm. a lot of readers. I thought I was going to spend so much time, um, and I, I, I did a bit. I, I, Craig was there for, we you know, traveled and did the festival thing for a while, where I, I had to do a lot of explaining about indigenous issues. Mm. Um, and then I realized that I was over explaining that people didn't really need to have all of this you know, historical background, that we all in some way understand what it is to be colonized that we all understand in some way what it is to try and survive, and we sure as hell yeah. understand what relationships mean through those times. Mm, so sure. it really was a bit more universal. I, I mean, sadly, it was a more of a universal terror um, than I had originally mm. thought. Both books are tender. Both books have, the, both of the teenage boys have love interests, don't they? And it's, mm. it, you know, you've both done that very beautifully, I think. Yeah, well, well, Craig is looking I mean, rather bemused. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's lovely to hear. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I appreciate that. And I, yeah. I think with Cherie's book, too, there is a lot of um, apocalypse uh, kind of dystopian fiction. But I think what Cherie managed to do was like I, the, the, the idea of the it. marrow uh, well, and ju yes. just the inventiveness of yes. that core idea. I mean, that's what makes any, any book within a specific sort of um, larger overarching genre. Um, really interesting is that you take something um, that is specific to Cherie and, mm -hmm. and to her background and to, to use that as the investment in character and in plot. Um, 
I just I found that when I was reading the book, that's what that's uh, many things resonated with me. But yeah. the inventiveness mm -hmm. of that, the uniqueness of that, was what what really set that book apart um, for me. Other than the characters, mm -hmm. which were obviously really well done. Margaret Thanks, Atwood Frank. said that when she was growing up in Canada, she didn't think that Canadians could be writers. There were just no e examples there. What is the how healthy is can, is Canada Canadian literature? Is it is it supported? That's a great question, Shri. What do you think? Oh, I'm kind of the anti-Canadian literature. Um, but I will say this, that we, we are completely uh, uh, embarrassingly blessed with gifted storytellers. Um, for, my, for myself, um, I mean, we are the people of story, the, the indigenous people. Uh, through my family, we pass along the, the, the role of being a story keeper. And it's about um, you know, maintaining our oral traditions, but then also making sure that we have the tools to move forward. So Canada is, is rife with storytellers from my community. Um, but also, just in general, we have some beautiful, remarkable voices. I'm not going to lie. Um, when I was started my reading, I stumbled a bit. And that's because I saw that Essie Adoyan was sitting there. Who is the Stephen Price too? Premier. What? Oh, no, I'm even more nervous. <laughs> yeah, they're both there. Yeah. I it just just these blessed, brilliant writers that we have, and and I think um, you know um, uh, Margaret Atwood, uh, you know, has has really you know moved Canadian voice in in many ways. But beyond that, there is there is just. There's so many gifted storytellers. Are, and I think the, the part where it gets a bit confused is we're still having this conversation where we're trying to figure out what is Canada's literary voice? What right. is Canlit? Which to me is kind of ridiculous that we're, you know, sort of... Um, still... It's, still trying we to... We don't have it. to... It, it, it no longer needs to kind of be... It's Because it seems to have exploded whatever bounds we, yeah. had, we had put on it back in maybe the 70s. Right. And I, I think there was a sense of it being like, you know... That was an old version of literature. Canlit, right, yeah. even the term itself, is associated with a lot of writers who I, I dearly love. Mm. Um, like? Well, like Monroe, I, th I would say yeah. like Atwood, like um, Robinson, uh, um, yeah. sorry, Robertson, Davies, mm. um, and, and others uh, of, of that ilk, Timothy Findlay, uh, which is the great, lovely writing, but I think today's writers, uh, not even of my generation, but of generations after, um, it, you respect that, and you understand where it's coming from, and I'm sure in the same way with, with Irish writing. So it's more uh, experimental now? Uh, experimental, diverse. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's incredibly diverse compared to what it would have been previously. We, you mm. know, have a, we are a, a culture made of a lot of um, either indigenous communities or, or immigrant communities, and mm. they have their own narratives that they want to tell and the stories that they want to tell. And so Canlit, in some way, was fairly rural, yeah. in terms of its yeah. fascination with its stories. Mm -hmm. And it was, for the time, it probably reflected Canada really well. Yeah. Um, and I'm not quite sure that a it does. A portion of Canada. Right, exactly. <laughs> it, it, that's right. It, it, it reflected a portion of Canada yeah. really well. And I think you would want any literature to be inclusive of what the makeup of yeah. Canada is now. And it's, uh, every, every culture changes over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm really hoping, I mean, we live in a global story society, yes. right? Yes, this is sure. why I think our kids, I mean, we talk about, um, you know, about the apocalypse, about the end of the world, and we, we think about these things, but really, this generation of kids now are, are brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. And they oh, live, yes. they live they, in this global yes. story community. And when I think about that, like from, from my perspective in, in the community, um, the story keepers are the leaders because you have the most knowledge. And so we have this whole generation of kids that have global stories. So they're educated on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And I really am looking for the day when we sort of break down those barriers of, you know, Canlit or American fiction and, and really understand that we're part of a global community. Yeah. Um, and, and, and really, the people who are doing that right now profoundly are, are women writers are, and yes. writers of color. They're the people who are absolutely taking things to the next level and thinking in terms of global story and in embracing what's best for the story, which is what we need to give the kids. Yeah. Well, we, we all need it, really. But is there support from the government? Do you have Arts Council grants? We do. And do you have, um, I was going to say a refuge. I don't mean a refuge, do I? I mean retreats. Do you have those sort of things set We have up? a really good festival. I don't know. Can you speak? I mean, I, I do know that there are grants. Canada Council gives out fairly, mm. um, I think, fair, well, I don't know. We have a government in charge that might be cutting back on that in Ontario especially. but. 
um, we, we had a fairly robust grant system that yeah. supported its writers. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that is still in operation mm -hmm. from what I can tell. And certainly mm -hmm. we have a really good festival. I mean, we're here basically on the behest of the Ottawa That's Writers right. Festival yes. who was able to get uh, granting money to get us here. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 I think, again, there are probably other people other than me anyways who would comment on that more knowledgeably. Mm -hmm. but, but, I, but at school, did you, did you feel, yes, I can be a writer? Yes, it's there. It's something that is possible. Hmm. Um, I personally remember being told to have a plan B um, because it was just incomprehensible. Yes, because yeah. because writing isn't something that you could you know really make a go of. It was a good hobby, sure. but you should have a real job in mind. Yeah, um, that, that's probably the world over. It's think, probably the it? world over. But I have to say, um, I had a lot of fun uh, touring with the book when I would go back to those old schools <laughs> and see those teachers uh, who you know probably just didn't want me to live in a hut on the side of the highway. Mm. But um, I put off that dream for a long time, and it also. So, um, and this still, you know, f is is uh, true in a lot of ways. The books that we had to read, um, first of all, in Canada, there's no there's no regulation that the books that you study have to be Canadian. Right. And so um, we ended up with a lot of the old guards. Like everyone I ever read was a was a dead white man. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah, so there was too. no connection, and I couldn't see, even though I had been raised in this world of story, I couldn't see it in a book. Right. It didn't. It didn't fit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now, for the first time ever, there are three generations of published Indigenous writers. So this is the first wow. time in history that we have, you know, three three generations um, that have been published. So and those books are making their way into sort of the, the schools mm -hmm. and out into the into the community wider. Um, but it was just the fact that I didn't see myself reflected in any of the stories. Right. Um, and I really, um, and you can yell at me about this later, but I really don't like Shakespeare. <laughs> and so it kind of put me off. I don't I'm think like, we'll yell at you okay. Yeah. <laughs> We'd like you to have Yeats, perhaps, or Beckett. <laughs> we, can, we can bitch about Shakespeare outside. Um, so so it, it, it sort of it put me off of, of yeah. writing. I just thought, okay, this isn't a potential. It's, it's something that's, uh, you know, as they said, a hobby, something mm -hmm. to do in my spare time. We're running out of time, but mm -hmm. what next? I mean, what, or I, you can either say what next or what. Ambition. What do you really want to achieve in the next, say, ten years? Is this oh. where do you want to go from here? What, what? You've got this mm. brilliant success now. You're established. What next? What? Where? What more? Oh my God! I feel like I'm on the Oprah show. I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Think of an answer. Oh, Craig, I'm so sorry. What do you want to know? <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it was lovely. That's a great. It's a great question. It's 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 tough to see that far ahead. I, for I had a question. Sorry, um, somebody asked me at the end of it. Thing. Are you happy? <laughs> and I froze. This is I've done not that as before bad. now. <laughs> <laughs> I have. You've asked that question? I have like, asked it before it's now. It's like an existential crisis. <laughs> Particularly with somebody who is a really serious writer. Oh, I see. I was going to say, if they were morose through the whole thing, yes. you might just so be like, I'm, I'm really worried that. about you. Are you happy? Or yeah. Yeah. Do we need to get you some help? <laughs> right. Craig, what do you want to do? Oh, in the next 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Who, you know, I, I, I think I'd just like to stay on this horse without it throwing me off, right. you know, because mm. it's, um, there's many people who are, have great stories and would love to be writers, and um, I know I have one of the most um, enjoyable jobs in the world, yep. um, and it's probably the only job that um, I can do, uh, so, you know, just just keep, keep, keep going, establishing relationships with readers. So and, you are uh, happy. I, I am. Well, now I am. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I am. And uh, but it's a it's a great question. But I think really for me, it's just to stay the course. Yeah. And for you, um, I I think I um, years ago I made a, a, a promise to my my friend. My friend and I were at the University of Toronto, and we were talking about what it was that we really wanted to do. And she, her, her parents and grandparents had been through residential school, and so she didn't speak her language. Um, and so she said. Uh, no matter what she said, and I remember the way she said it. She said, "I refuse to die without okay, I'm my not language." It's hay fever. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. <laughs> no, I love it. Do it. It's <laughs> setting an atmosphere. She said, "I refuse to die without my language." And I said, um, "Okay, I I'm going to write these stories from my community as I know them, and I'm not going to compromise on them." Right. Um, and so we shook on it. And I remember I made her promise. I said, "If if this book, if I write a book and it ever wins an award, you have to come and." do the speech in the language, in Anishinaabe right. Moen. Um, and so the first award that the book won was the Governor General's. And so uh, I had to go to the House of the Queen in Canada uh, with the, her representative. 
And so you do your acceptance speech and they give you three minutes and they say, it's, it's very policed. You have to hand it in ahead of time and they have to approve it. Literally by like Mounties, it's very intimidating. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I said, okay, I, I have no problem with that, but I don't know if you're going to be able to read it because it's going to be in, in the Ojibwe language. Um, and I'm having my friend do it. And they said, I'm sorry, we, we can't do it. And I said, why? And they said, because it's never been done. Um, and I said, okay, that's fair. And I'm not threatening you or anything, but what do you think I'm going to say when you give me the mic if you tell me I can't bring my language into the House of the Queen? Um, and so they said, good point, uh, go mm -hmm. ahead. <laughs> and, and, so, um, and so for the first time um, in that house that represents you know, the, the, the colonizing government, uh, our language was spoken. She gave the entire acceptance speech in Anishinaabe Moan, and it was for a book that I had written completely from my community with, with our kids as, as the heroes. And in that moment, I realized what was, what was truly important, and it was... It was getting the stories out there, and, and once they're out there, holding them in a good way. Because the thing with story is, you can write a story, um, and, and you can publish it, but you, it's a gift, and you have to hold it properly so that everyone can have access to that gift. Yeah, so... <laughs> so more of that. <laughs> well, now it's over to you. Questions? This mic microphone is just coming. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I just am on fire listening to you and your wonderful enthusiasm and pioneering spirit, well, for your own people, and the fact that you wanted it to be young adult so that you could go to those nine-year-olds and give them hope. Uh, I think that is wonderful, and I just want to say how thrilled I am to hear that and just admire your courage and your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Do I see any hands? Uh, so just a two-part question. Um, I suppose just recently I've kind of fallen into the era, the, the era of aud uh, audio books. Um, are either of your books available um, on audio book? And what do you think of the, that kind of um, that medium? And just secondly, if you could have anyone dead or alive read your book like that, who would it be? Very good question. Ooh. That's a good question. Your, yours are on audiobook, yeah? Uh, yeah, uh, I think most of my books are on audiobook. Um, and I like it. I think actually some readers really, um, especially the stuff I write under Nick Cutter, there's a guy, Corey Brill, who does all the, the readings, and the readers seem to pr prefer <laughs> the, uh, the audiobook versions oftentimes of those books. Um, so, uh, and I, that's great. I mean, to me, I, I don't know if Cherie would agree, but. I mean, anything that gets people reading or, you know, interacting with mm -hmm. books in whatever way, whether it's you're listening to it, whether you're, you know, an e-reader, whether it's, a, you know, a paper book, which are still my, my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes, would you agree? Yeah, um, I, I, so my, The Merrill Thieves is available on audiobook, and in a lot of ways, um, um, I think it works better just because, again, it comes from an oral tradition. So the way that it's written is, it follows the way that... Um, if you read certain parts of the book, say where the old woman is speaking, it's it's my grandmother. So the way that you know English was her uh, third language, so you know some of the inconsistencies, and that was a fight with the editors where they're like, "This is you don't put there at the end of a sentence." I'm like, "Oh, mm. we do mm. sometimes." Did, did you did you read your own? I didn't. So so um, a young man from the community uh, uh, read it, and he did a beautiful job. Um, so the, so the the second question was, who would be idea your ideal person to be the mm. reader? Or was it the ideal person to be the reader, or just someone we could? Uh, or wanted to read our work or hang out with? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you just contextualize that as, I mean, who's my, who's my favorite writer or the most influential writer for me has always been Stephen King. Um, so uh, if I could hang out with uh, the whole King family, actually. You throw, <laughs> throw Joe Hill and Owen in there and Tabitha. It'd, it'd be lovely to break bread with all of them. So I have um, kind of a controversial uh, author that I really love, and I... Um, I remember saying it once on a radio show, and boy, howdy did I get hell from 
um, callers after. It's Charles Bukowski. Oh, who's yeah, a really German American. I did. They were, and, and I mean, people were like, "You're a really bad feminist because mm. he was a horrible he, man." Yeah, and no. I'm like, "He was a horrible man, but my God, could that man write?" Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think I, I think I would love to uh, spend time with him. Um, although I don't know if my liver can handle it. <laughs> he's a bit of a drinker. I would try my best. <laughs> This is a question for Sherry. Is having the dream the key to survival? Is that what you're trying to say in your book? Is having the dream the key to survival? Survival, yeah. Yeah, so part of it came from uh, this understanding was, um, I mean, there's a whole, I won't get into it because I know we're, we don't have a lot of time. There's a whole backstory to where I came up with the Marathies. Part of it is this, um, is when they took, so again, the last residential school closed in 1996. So it's not a very distant past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 1996, yeah, in Saskatchewan. Time. No, yeah, no, yeah. and it was generations. So, so yeah. this is something when I travel, people are often, um, you know, because Canada is such a yeah. friendly, lovely nation, yeah. <laughs> not to all of us, but um, so, so part of what I understand is this. Um, those kids, when they went in, some of them were as young as two uh, and didn't come out until they were teenagers, uh, and they had numbers, not names, uh, and they had tags that had their numbers. Um, and so my good friend Richard Van Camp, his oh, mother, course, yeah, his mother Richard. was 11 for 12 years. That was her name, 11. Um, so, so through all of that, and generations of people went into these schools. This, to this day, we have our stories, and we have our language, uh, and we have our ceremonies. And so we know that even in the worst of circumstances, even when they were being beaten. Uh, and, and locked away and told that there was no hope that this is this, they had to leave all of this, you know, Indian stuff behind. We know that still they held the dream of us, that they thought at some point there would be a generation that could pick up those stories and say those words in our language. We are our ancestors' wildest dream, and we're here. And so they held on to that, and they were beaten for it, and, and they you know, were starved for it, but they did it. And so we are the living embodiment of the dream. And so part of it is about holding on to hope, and it's, as I said earlier, it's about who do you want to be at the end of your survival. Yeah? It's one thing to survive, but if you can survive as a people, if, if, I can, if I can come to Ireland and see Gaelic, if I can talk to people who have the original stories from this land, man, did you survive, yeah? It's who you are at the end of the survival, so that is a huge part of the dream, yeah. You're doing a fabulous job, <laughs> microphone guy. <laughs> Cover yeah. some laps. Yes. <laughs> Cover some miles. Uh, Sherry, uh, are your books available in the uh, indigenous languages? Not yet. Thank oh, yeah. you for asking. Uh, so, so there are words in in the, the stories that are in the language, yeah. um, and that was a conversation with my publisher where they said, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to put these these words in because people won't be able to understand it. Um, and I said, which people are you talking about? Yes, <laughs> there are lots exactly. of people that will understand it, um, and I refuse to put it into a glossary um, because. The, the language that it's in, Anishinaabe, Moan, Ojibwe, is you can literally go on Google and put it in and you, you can find the translations. Point. Right, and so yeah. I said I don't want, I don't want it I italicized yeah. and I didn't want it in a glossary because I didn't want to other it. Yeah. So there's some in there, but uh, that is the dream, to oh, get it oh, in the languages. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We have time certainly for one more, possibly two, depending how... Look at him go. <laughs> um, um, this isn't related to your books at all, but it's because you're Canadian, um, my hero at the moment is Jordan Peterson. What do you think of him? He's not my hero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's lovely that you... Uh, uh, it's not lovely that you feel that way, actually, but uh, it's fine that you feel that way, I suppose. Um, why do you like him so much? I, I, think, I think he's so on PC. I think he just... He's that. Yeah. He's that. I, I, I think people are so careful what they say these days, and he isn't. 
Well, I... Sorry, Cherie, do you have anything to say on this? Nope. Uh, <laughs> you've, managed, you've managed to shut them up. That's yep. Quite a... <laughs> He's a Canadian. One, one more question. Here in the front, no. Not too far to walk this time. <laughs> it's not the same question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just in terms of um, writing for young people, you both mentioned that you have kids yourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you use your kids as editors? Well, use is probably the wrong word, okay. Mm. Oh, I use do you, them. <laughs> you, how much involvement do your children have in your process? Um, huh. Do you use them as, as sound bites? Do you use them? Mm. That's do you, a really good Do you question. observe mm. them and, and use parts of their lives in the way you describe young people? Mm. Do you read them if they say, no, mom, dad, no, nah, that doesn't work? How much influence do they have in terms of editing your process and the work that you use? Mm. I want to hear about Nick. Well, your, yours, your, your son is seven, so... Yeah, yeah the, he's... The, yeah, uh, you know, um, I think it's un, 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 uh, impossible not once... once. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say this, because it's. I don't mean to make an overarching point, but for, for me, definitely the fiction that I've written since I've had my son, uh, since we've had our son, is different than the fiction that I wrote beforehand. Um, mm. More from the point... You have fatherhood, yeah, and I mean, uh, there, this is not my. I didn't make this up. I think it was uh, Hanya Yagira, uh, her book, and she said something like, um, "Having a child um, makes you. Uh, it opens a well of a new, a, w a new well of fear that you've never felt before. You know, you can you can have certain fears that you never felt before. So I can read, for example, I read say Pet Cemetery, which is essentially about a man. Uh, a family losing their child and what they might mm -hmm. do to get that child back, no matter how horrific, um, as, as a 13-year-old. And I thought, oh, this is gross and terrifying. But I read it again as a dad, and it was a whole new level of resonance that you feel yeah. like that maybe I would do that, you know? So, so it's the effect he's had on you. It's, the, it's definitely the effect, yeah. And when he's yeah. a teenager, that's when he has to worry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but it's a great question because because your your children do. I mean, I think my next book I want to write is is a kids book, and I want to really involve because obviously children see the world at a skew that I can no longer see it at. So if I can, I don't mean to you know kind of siphon it away from him in some parasitical way, but like the way that he sees the world, if I can have some access to that through him, it might help me write you that have book a better. Low threshold of boredom, I think, because you're you're. Chopping genres. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you know, yeah, the Rolling yeah. Stone gathers no moss yeah. sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, and I do. I, I mean, I love so many kids' books, and it's sort of a sense of like I'd like to um, try my hand at that as well. Mm -hmm. So, I how about you? And what about you? How mm -hmm. old are your children? Um, so, my my youngest is thirteen. Uh, yeah. My middle girl is nineteen, and my boy is twenty-seven. Um, oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. I love you. <laughs> And um, so I would not have been able to write uh, the, the, you know, from the perspective of a teenage boy without having lived with a teenage boy yeah. um, and knowing things like, for example, always knock before you walk into his room. <laughs> Why? And, <laughs> because he could be <laughs> no, I studying. Know. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. Very you busy wanna, studying. You don't want to disrupt him during his study. And you have to do a yeah. lot of laundry when there's a lot of study. <laughs> and also, um, how awkward things can be, like uh, how I just made them awkward for some people, and, and uh, how you have to navigate that and, and what the emotionality of that, of that interior life is. And it and it's, uh, was interesting for me, especially with him um, and writing the character, um, because because of that rich interior life of a young man, when they're when they're cut off from so many outlets of, of expressing their their love or their fear, right? They have to man up, and so they have this beautiful, rich interior life that's kind of pushed pushed back to them. So it was really interesting. So I do um, use them absolutely. I'll use the word use. I I, I use them. Um, they don't read as much as I, I wish they would. Um, I kind of force my work on on them, and they're like, "Oh, it's boring. Can't we just, you know, do something else?" And I'm like, "You're terrible people. <laughs> you should read my work." Um, but yeah, it, yes. and it's it is it is that whole thing also where it opens up this new understanding. Like for me, watching my kids grow up, I was like, "Oh my God, I have to tell them so much. I have to tell them so much before they 
before they're you know too old to, to listen mm -hmm. or until I can make them listen. Both books are available for sale and you will be signing. You're prepared to sign, yes? Absolutely. Sure. Um, before I sort of completely wrap up, this is my last gig. I've done five this week and I just want to say Woo. that th you've been the best audiences all week. Unbelievable, the best festival audience is yeah. possible, and your questions have been incredible. Yeah. I think you should give yourselves a hand, actually. <laughs> and now a big hand for Shiri and Craig. <laughs> Good job.